answer our prayer, we will ask him to speak to our hearts again tonight. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we come to you in the name of Jesus, and we are asking that you would speak to us again. I believe that people who will be here throughout the week at camp meeting will be blessed every time they're under this roof. We would ask that you would visit us in a special way, that you would speak to our hearts, and then move us, draw us, lead us to be closer to Jesus than we've ever been. You have arranged it so that we are alive and on this earth during some of the most crucial movements in all of history. We thank you for the front row seat. We thank you for the privilege of being yours right now. Speak to us right now, please, we ask you, and we pray in Jesus' name. Please say with me, amen. amen. It was a little over 500 years ago, and a young German priest stood before what was in all reality likely the most august body of believers that, sorry, most august body of individuals that had ever been assembled. These were church leaders. These were heads of state. These were important folks. And the authority figures there that day looked Martin Luther in the eye and demanded that he recant. Now, that means they were asking Luther to take back what he had said and what he had written. Now, of course, in practical terms, that would be exceedingly difficult to do so because much of what he said was widely regarded by everybody to be true. So do you just say, I recant everything that I said because there would be involved in that a denial of the plainly obvious. But that wasn't the only thing. You know that Luther believed that what he had said was true and right and needed and timely. When Luther nailed the 95 Theses to the door of the castle church in Wittenberg, Germany, uh, most of those, you might say all, the vast majority of those points dealt with the false teaching of indulgences. That by doing a certain deed or paying a certain price, you could receive remission of sin. There was a saying there, even in the German, it was a, it was, it was a, a rhyme. Uh, once the coin, uh, oh, I'm forgetting the rhyme myself, but when the coin landed in the bottom of that, that, that box, someone's soul would automatically spring free from purgatory. Of course that was a lie. There's nothing in the Bible that teaches the idea of purgatory. And Martin Luther spoke against that and the abuses of the Church of Rome. He knew that indulgences were being sold to finance the building of St. Peter's, that magnificent basilica in the Vatican City within the confines of Rome. And by the way, if you ever have a chance to go and see St. Peter's, I recommend that you do. I've visited it several times, and I've been thrilled every time I've walked inside. I walk inside the, inside the St. Peter's Basilica, and something within me leaps for joy. Something within me thrills, and I turn in the direction of heaven, and I say, thank God that I am a Protestant. It brings me great joy. He knew that St. Peter's was being built with funding raised from essentially spiritual extortion. That's what the indulgences by Tetzel and others were being sold for, to build that undeniably magnificent building. They demanded Luther recant, and Luther said, Luther said, here I stand. I can do no other. So help me God. And he likely ended with the word, amen. I cannot recant. I cannot retract. I cannot deny what I have said. If I have been wrong, prove my error from the Scriptures. But otherwise, i got to stand by what I said. Luther was bold, wasn't he? He was bold. But in actuality, I'm not denying now that he was bold. All he did was stand for the Bible. That's all. Luther simply said, see what's written in here? I happen to believe that it is true. 
Turn with me in your Bible to Revelation and chapter 14. When you get to Revelation chapter 14, you are introduced in the first verse to the 144,000. Those standing on Mount Zion with the Lamb, that's Jesus. They have the Father's name, that's the character of God, written or formed in their foreheads, in their minds. Within them has been reformed the character of Jesus, restored into their beings. We get down to verse 6. And we are introduced to to one of the three angels who bring the three angels' messages. These are the messages. This is the passage of Scripture. These are the biblical principles that are responsible for forming God's last day saints, those who believe the Word of God and have been formed in the image of Jesus. The first angel speaks. Fear God and give glory to Him. The hour of His judgment has come. Worship Him that made heaven and earth and the seas and the fountains of waters. The second angel speaks and says that Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city. Because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And then the third angel speaks and says with a loud voice in the Greek, that's megaphone, as though speaking with a, what we would call a megaphone, If any man worship the beast at his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, that same individual will drink of the wine of the wrath of God, poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. You read on, you learn pretty quickly that is the most solemn warning message in all of the New Testament. That's serious. And then we read on to verse 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. So, friend of God, God has told us that there will be a generation of individuals who will stand for Jesus in earth's days. It doesn't make them super saints. It doesn't make them stronger than anybody else. It doesn't make them uh, wiser than anybody else. It does not make them braver than anybody else. It simply means that when that moment comes, they choose to surrender to Jesus rather than to sell out, rather than being like Peter when the heat came on. I don't know him. You must have me confused, turning the air blue with his cursing. They, like Luther, simply stand and say, I believe the Word of God is the Word of God. That's faith. You don't need to have great faith. You can simply have a little faith in a great God. Because correctly understood, Christianity down here in the end of time is turning over control of our lives to Jesus and allowing him to live his life in us. That's all. Faith is his idea. He has promised to lead you. You will hear a voice behind you when you turn to the left and when you turn to the right saying, this is the way. Walk ye in it. We are coming to a great crisis down in the close of time. There will be a dividing line. You can call it what you want, but it's going to be surrender to Jesus or otherwise. Fidelity to the Almighty or that little Peter act where we say, you've got the wrong guy. I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know this man. Ladies and gentlemen, it occurs to me that down here in the close of time, the devil is at the top of his game. He is working to distract people like they've never been distracted before. He'll even distract you with important things. Now, you know that many of our congregations, they get distracted, and and this is the old, the old, the old cliche. They get distracted with arguments about the color of the carpet. Look, we've got to get beyond that. We had a board meeting at our church, and the pastor said, oh, there's this issue, and there's this thing, and church members feel hot about it, and he wanted to make a little change. And it was to the decor of the church, the decor. It wasn't a board meeting, it was an elders meeting. And he turned to us, the elders, and he said, so what do you think? I got in first. I said, what we think, brethren, what we think is that you should just go ahead and do whatever you want to do. We'll support you, and then we can move on with mission. We don't want this to degrade and break down and become an argument about the color of the carpet. I don't even care what the color of the carpet is. And frankly, if you asked me, I couldn't tell you what the color of the carpet is in my church. That's how little I care about it. 
So let's move on from the distraction. We make a decision and get on with the business of the business of the church. I don't understand why congregations want to get bogged down with these little things. Does it matter? I mean, on some level it does. You don't want ugly carpet. On some level it matters. But why would you let that use any more of the oxygen in your lungs than it needs and prevent you from getting on with what really moves the needle as a congregation? So we want to move beyond those little piddling things. And then we get bogged down by some of these great divisive, I don't know if you want to call them political or ecclesio ecclesiastical or ecclesiological issues in our church. And you might even be able to think about some of the ones that have occupied our time in recent times. I would like you just to think about an issue and think about the energy that we as a church have dedicated to certain issues. And therefore, what we might have done had we dedicated that same energy to mission and evangelism and soul winning. You see how clever the devil is? He gets us caught up in issues and slows us down, and we're not then focusing on mission. We just don't want to be like that. Then you get the devil distracting people by, by having them notice some of the things in the church that are not perfect. And then they go writing about them on websites. And then they go doing videos and putting it on YouTube. And then they start sending around missives and bulletins and this and that. And some of the less mature saints get angry when they see these things. I remember when I was brand new in the church, brand new, wasn't baptized. I'd been coming for a few weeks and I looked around and I saw some of the stuff in my congregation that we didn't have back in the Catholic church where I was raised, at least not that I knew about. And I wrestled with this and I said, Lord, why would it be that that guy's fooling around on his wife? Why would it be that that guy is, is acting like this and this poor woman is having this experience and the Sabbath school teacher, oh, I got my worries there. Why would that be? And what God did was he led me to Revelation chapter 12 where I read, and the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. That answered it for me. Of course not everything's perfect. For one, I'm in the church, and any church that would have me cannot be a perfect church. Secondly, if this church is really the apple of God's eye, you know the devil is coming after it with both barrels. You know he wants to slow us down and trip us up. He wants to crowd the unconverted in among us. He wants to divert our attention, get it off what's good and onto what is needless. You understand that? Of course there are going to be problems in the church. What do you expect? It's a church. There's 23 million of us. Different educational levels, different cultural backgrounds, different ideas, different levels of commitment to God. Of course it's not going to be perfect, but earth is not heaven. It's never been perfect, but don't let that dissuade you. Somebody let you down. You know what happened? Somebody get let down in the church and leave the church. What in the world for? Where are you going if you leave the church? Oh, people shouldn't have treated me like that. I'll agree with you they shouldn't have treated you like that. But they did. And now you get to choose how to respond. You can allow these things to push you closer to Jesus or further away from Jesus. And it's a crazy day when people get bumped and bruised in the church and then decide they are better off without God in their lives. I'm not excusing the church. Listen, church, we need to do a better job of looking after people. We ought to treat people a little better so that we don't bruise them and injure them. We ought to, we ought to show maybe more love to the erring and those who are out of the way. Not toleration of crazy stuff. I don't mean you're signing off and, uh, uh, on bad behavior. I mean that. But we don't want to lower the boom on people, especially young people. You were young once. You remember what a Muppet you were. And so when young people today aren't keeping it between the white lines, they're drifting this way and that way. Love them. Love them. So that when they come back to their senses, they can say, I can go back to that church because it's full of people who love me. If you're older and there's a young person in the church who's a bit rough around the edges, be like a loving grandparent to that person. Not some referee who would blow a whistle and show a red card and send that person off. Friend, 
We want to love people as much as we possibly can. So, so let's be careful that we are, we are representing Jesus in the church. We're in a crisis down here. You don't want to get sidetracked by these crazy, theologically divisive issues. No, it's not even the elephant in the room now. It's the herd of elephants in the room. And that would be the subject of anti-Trinitarianism. Ladies and gentlemen, we resolved that long ago. Long ago. Well, didn't the Catholics come up with that? Well, strictly no, but even if they did, I don't care. I only care about whether it's right or wrong. And when you look in the Bible, you cannot avoid the truth that the Father is God, His Son Jesus is God, and the Holy Spirit is God. Now, here's what happens. It's a tough one. What does the Holy Spirit look like? I don't know it, I don't care, but it might really matter to you. Is it the Spirit of God? If that means it's the Spirit of God, how can he be the Son? Jesus is called the Son, so he must be God's literal Son. He's also called the Lamb. Are you going to tell him he's, are you going to tell me now he must be woolly? He's called the door. Is he made out of wood or is he made out of glass? You see, what we're doing is we're getting hung up on little things. And because we find it hard to understand and hard to get easy answers, we want to reduce things down so far that we bend the Scriptures out of shape. Let me appeal to you. If you genuinely find the Trinity a challenging subject, then pray and study and study and pray and ask God to work it through with you. That's okay. Just don't raise hell in the church. Just don't do that. Just don't be one of these evangelists who's gone grabbing people, pulling them out, sharing with them how unhappy you are with the church, how the church must be wrong, therefore we got to separate. I've got a question for you. Go find me a group of anti-Trinitarians who left the church 10 years ago. And then ask yourself whether they have grown in faith in those 10 years. Has their movement grown? Have they started a school? Have they established sanitariums? Have they got missionaries going to earth's remotest bounds? Are they baptizing people? That would be no, 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 and no. That tells you everything you need to know. I appeal to you. Don't let these issues steal your joy, rob you of your faith, bump you out of the church, lead you closer away from the truth of the word of God. The devil is at the top of his game. Some of us make his job way too easy through some of the dopey decisions we make. Yes, of course, there are passages in the Bible that are difficult. So why would that make you the enemy of the church or the church the enemy of you? Hang in there. I don't understand how my cell phone works. I just don't get it. That's really difficult for me. Maybe for you it's okay. I don't, but I just accept that it does. I have a rudimentary understanding. When it comes to the Word of God, I'm not saying I have a rudimentary, rudimentary understanding of the way the, uh, the Godhead works. I don't think I do. But if you are struggling with that, don't let that struggle trip you up because the devil is good at what he does and he is tripping up many. And where that issue is, there are other issues. We are losing the point down here. The point is mission and it's ministry and it's reaching the lost and it's representing Jesus because as we have read here in Revelation chapter 14, while it didn't say so explicitly, we are living in earth's last days. First angel called us to fear God and give glory. Why? Because we are living in the time of earth's final judgment. In 1844, Jesus entered the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary to begin the final work of judgment, where he started to review the names in the book of life and determine, based on the profession and the themselves, who will be saved and who will be lost. The investigative ju judgment is, best way I can understand it, an audit. Jesus is just going through the books of record, looking at the decisions you made, and then honoring those decisions. It's just that simple. You should fear the judgment if you are not in a saving relationship with Jesus. 
But if Jesus is your Lord and Savior, you can rejoice because we read in the book of heaven, uh, in the book of Hebrews, that Jesus is in heaven right now for us. He is your advocate with, your, with the Father. He is your mediator. He is your friend. We have been told to come boldly to the throne of grace where we can find mercy and grace to help in time of need. Read that in Hebrews and chapter 4. It's judgment time and it is good news. If you have Jesus, you face the judgment with confidence. Then right after that, worship him who made heaven and earth and the seas and the fountains of waters. This means worship Christ as creator. And the sign of his creative power is the seventh day Sabbath. What a good idea that was, the Sabbath. God created us uh, with a circadian rhythm. We are naturally on a 24-hour cycle. Scientists, secular scientists, have discovered that we also run on a circuseptin rhythm. We are naturally wired to follow a seven-day cycle. That's how we simply function. And God said it is in your best interest to step aside on the Sabbath. Now, you hear, you understand something about the Sabbath. I want to encourage you to be careful about your Sabbath keeping and make the day a day of joy, not a day of drudgery, particularly for your children. You're going to have to invest time in introducing your children to the joy of the Sabbath. Let them know it's a day of great opportunity, infinite possibility, a day of great gladness. And I was not slow or apologetic about explaining to my kids there are some things we just don't do. It's a special day. It's God's day. We've got six days for those other things. Let's make this a day about honoring God. It is a wonder to me that there are people in the earth who cannot see that the seventh day is the Sabbath. I just said a wonder. I mean that not in any belligerent or, or argumentative way. You sit somebody down who's never even heard of God, say, this is God's book, start at the beginning in Genesis 1, and keep reading until you discover which day the, seventh day Sab or which day the Sabbath is. They'll get about 30 verses. It'll take them four minutes, maybe less, and they'll come to you and say, I have found it. It is about the clearest thing in all of the Bible. Why does the world not understand? Numerous reasons. But I certainly don't want to get critical, particularly of Christian believers who are doing their very best and acting in sincerity. The Spirit of God will convict them as we pray, as we share, and sometimes in spite of us, as we do nothing at all. God will speak to hearts. But here's what we know. We know that Babylon has fallen. Babylon, that word that comes from confusion. Babylon, confusion. The, the Christian world is in confusion today. Long ago, the Roman papacy accepted as part of its teachings the false Sabbath, the day of the sun. Best as our understanding is, is that this change was made first legally by the Roman emperor Constantine. And then when the emperors passed off the scene and the bishops stepped into their place, they merely absorbed into Christian teaching this thing which had already become law. Of course it's falsehood. But this is the work of Antichrist. It's the work of the great apostate. It's the work of that great system that will tell you that your salvation is based on faith and works. That we believe in scripture and tradition. Well, no, of course it's not. And of course we don't. But we are in a world where, where truth doesn't seem to matter to everybody. Like you might think it does. Listen, if we're waiting for the day till what we believe becomes the most popular thing in the world, we are waiting for a bus that will never arrive. God has not called us to stand with the most popular crowd. He didn't even ask us to stand with the majority because when you stand with Jesus, it is then that you are with the majority. Christ is the majority. Would you say amen? We stand on the word of God like Luther did. Here I stand. I can do no other. So help me God. Amen. This comes to a head in the third angel's message. If anybody worships the beast, that is the Roman papacy and his image, and receives his mark in his forehead or in his hand, that one will drink of the wine of the wrath of God. We understand by now that the mark of the beast is enforced Sunday sacredness. That does not mean that the entire world will be forced to convert to Catholicism. That day won't ever come. But what it means is that for reasons that by now 
we must understand a little more clearly the forgery Sabbath, the fake Sabbath, the uh, inappropriate, the, 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 the false Sabbath will be offered to the world as a panacea for its problems. Now, if you can think back over the last couple of years, you can see now that the world desperately needs a day out every week. We are running hard and we are running fast and we're running ourselves into the ground. God gave us that day out. Well, that's not accepted by any sort of majority. You can imagine now how the world might get into such a place where it is considered that we just simply have to step back and honor the will of God and accept a Sabbath rest. That it will be the wrong Sabbath we understand from reading in the Holy Bible. What do you do on that day? What do you do on that day? There was Peter, bold Peter, except, of course, he followed Jesus from a great way off. And when they turned to him, he wilted. You know, even Martin Luther wilted. When he gave his great speech, here I stand, I can do no other, that was day two. On day one, they asked him to speak. And he asked for more time. He wasn't ready. Speak, Luther. State your case. He wasn't ready. Something within him just wasn't strengthened like it ought to have been. He said, give me a day. He went to his room. He remonstrated with himself about his lack and his weakness and about caving in and about not being bolder when the bright lights were shone on him. That next day he went back. Luther folded. You read about Huss and Jerome, and was it Jerome who struggled, or am I thinking about another reformer? It was one of the Oxford martyrs who denied his faith and then, and then later recanted his denial and stood boldly for Jesus in the flames. Listen, friend, God is merely asking us to make a bold decision, a decision rather, to allow Jesus to live his life in us. And then when somebody says, what do you believe? You say, Jesus, go ahead and tell him, and he will work in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. Ladies and gentlemen, we are on the edge of a great, a stupendous crisis. And what we must understand is whether we will receive God's seal, the seventh-day Sabbath, or Revelation's mark, Sunday sacredness. And here's the thing. I believe that too many of us have been guilty about making earth's last great crisis about an issue. When the issue really is Jesus. Oh, no, no, I'm not watering down the Sunday Sabbath thing. I don't mean that. But if you think that all you need to be is right in your mind on that issue, decided on that issue, then you're only going part way to where you need to be. You could have Sabbath right and still be well and truly unconverted. I don't want to be too bold, but we may have evidence of that here in this room tonight. You've probably seen that at your church. You might have seen it in your house. You might have seen it in your life. We can be all right and all wrong. God's calling us to go further than merely checking boxes. Now, there's somebody else over here who's going to say, oh, you need to worry about that. You just need to love Jesus. And you see, there's some truth to that. Some truth to that. The actual level ground is loving Jesus with all your heart and understanding and believing in his word and standing on that and yielding your life to Jesus so that he has all of you all the time. And of course, that is a growing experience. We cannot afford to be so right that we're wrong or merely right with our theories and our doctrines. It was said some time ago that we need to experience the Sabbath more fully. Ooh, did you ever stop and think about what that might mean? The Sabbath more fully. The Sabbath ought to be a representation of the work that Jesus is doing in our lives. We have ceased from our labors. We are resting in the finished work of Almighty God. We believe that He is creator and that He will end, finish the great work that He has started in our lives. Ladies and gentlemen, God is calling to somebody to have a little boldness now, irrespective of the consequences. Somebody once wrote, choose the right because it is right and leave the consequences with God. And we can be that individual. So it's time to say, I pray because I am. 
I read my Bible because I must hear from the Lord. I believe the Word of God because it's the Word of God. I don't get into the silly, petty arguments that people want to start up a church because they're just a distraction. And as a believer in Jesus, I don't have time for that. Of course, there is time that you must speak. There are times that you've got to share your opinion. But I'm talking about the side issues, and that's what most of them are. Every breath you give to that nonsense is a breath less you give to mission and ministry and saving somebody and reaching somebody and letting Jesus use you to share him with others. Friend, we are caught in the midst of a great controversy. A great controversy. We wrestle not with flesh and blood, but with principalities and powers, with spiritual wickedness. In high places. We are wrestling down here. The dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed. Let me digress here. This this probably isn't a digression, but it's going to sound like one. I want to share something with you from my heart. Revelation 12. The dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the... I want to share something with you. It's of great concern to me. I've been in ministry for many years now, and I've seen this again and again and again and again. You know what's happening, don't you, is that we're starting to lose our self-identity as the remnant. Being the remnant does not mean that we are the only saved ones. It does not mean that. It doesn't mean we're better than anybody else. It doesn't mean that. It doesn't mean that being part of the remnant is an automatic get-out-of-jail-free card or an absolute guaranteed one-way ticket to heaven. It doesn't mean that. Because this is the church militant yet and not the church triumphant. But what it means is that just like God called Noah to build an ark, it was present truth for Noah's time, the rain is coming. Just like God raised up John the Baptist to herald the arrival of the Messiah. Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. He gave Noah a message. He gave John the Baptist a message. Just like God gave Martin Luther a message. Justification by faith. Salvation by faith alone or through faith alone. By grace alone and Christ alone. That was the message that God gave the reformers for that time. Not all the reformers were on exactly the same page. God bless them. But it seems to have worked out for the glory of God. God has given his end time people a message. It's the three angels' messages. It is the message of preparation for the return of Jesus. There are many voices saying God is love and Jesus loves you. We respect them and we thank God for them. But there is another voice that is saying there is a crisis on the way. Jesus is coming soon. He has called us to be the the repairers of the breach. To point out that while nine commandments are being kept and one is being ignored, that's, that's rebellion and that's incompleteness. And that Jesus is wanting to demonstrate in this world what the grace of God can do in the lives of those who are truly submitted and converted and surrendered. We are to tell people that they have the opportunity to experience the joy of true worship, of true worship, where we come into harmony with the Creator. The the devil is so good, he's been attacking creation, attacking creation, pushing forward this, this crazy idea of evolution. Don't get caught up in that in any way at all. It's just not biblical, and it's damnable. But we say, there is a Creator. His name is Jesus. He wants to live his life in you, remake you, recreate you. He wants you to have that experience of true worship because if you're not experiencing that, you are following not a commandment of God but a teaching of man. You're not following Jesus Christ. Instead, you have chosen the lordship of Antichrist. You're not, when you're living in rebellion against the commandments of God, yielding fully to Jesus. Now, in ignorance, that's another story, but once you know, And friend of God, what we know from reading these three angels' messages is that one day soon, everybody is going to know. This issue will be broadcast. It will be shared. 
it will go around the globe just like the equator does. Everybody's going to know. Things are a little different now. But one day, everybody's going to know. God has called the remnant into existence to be the, the guardians, if you like, and the proclaimers of earth's final gospel message. That's our job. It's our role. And when you no longer recognize the church as the remnant, we no longer have a special place. We no longer have a special mission. We are just another church on a landscape full of churches. There's no longer any real reason for our existence. God did not call us simply to be the Saturday go to church people. Oh, that's part of what we do. But he called us to be the remnant, the remnant containing the message, containing wrong word, possessing the message, sharing the message. It's why we are a missionary people, because we must have everybody know that Jesus is coming back and that only full surrender to the will and the word of God is adequate preparation for that time. He's coming back soon. Friend of God, if we let go of the idea that we are the remnant, our mission will, will falter. Our zeal will flag. Our commitment to mission will start to weaken. We will forget why we are even here in the world at all. We must reclaim that, that position God has given us and believe that he has called us to be the remnant, a church with a special mission. A mis Let me try that again. Sound like a church with a mishmash, the way I'm saying it. A church with a special message and a church with a defined mission to take the gospel to the world and make disciples for Jesus before Jesus comes back. Let me say another thing, because I can. I want to encourage you here. The devil was wroth with the woman. The dragon, the dragon was wroth. The devil was mad with the church. Why, I wonder? Because they keep the commandments of God. Yep, that would make them mad. And because they have the, Revelation 12, 17, the testimony of Jesus. Revelation 19 and verse 10 tells us that the testimony of Jesus is the? Can I appeal to you? Friend of God, this is no time to go soft on the spirit of prophecy. I would encourage you to be not so overbalanced that all you ever read are the testimonies and you never read the Bible. That, that, that was never the design. And I'm not that worried about people who come, become fanatical because there's this many people who become fanatical and this many people who never read the books at all. That's worse. Friend, I want to encourage you, don't surrender the spirit of prophecy now. Don't give it up. I want to encourage you to read the books that God inspired for you, for you. I know they're inspired because of what they've done in my life. How I see them point to Scripture and point to Jesus. I'm standing here because I once read the great controversy. Changed my life. That's why I keep reading it. It's a powerful, powerful book. If you haven't read it in a while, read it. Especially now. So late in the history of this earth. If you haven't read Steps to Christ, then you haven't read what has to be the greatest book outside of the Bible ever written on the subject of righteousness by faith. Powerful book. If you have not read Christ's object lessons, you have robbed yourself. If you haven't read it for years, read it again. Education is worth reading. Ministry of Healing is a book you ought to read. Uh, if you haven't read the Conflict of the Ages series, Patriarchs and Prophets, Prophets and Kings, uh, Desire of Ages, Acts of the Apostles, Great Controversy. Read that series. You can read it in a year. Of course you can. Read the nine volumes of the testimonies. Read them. You're going to find, man, she's in volume one talking about the American dress. Oh, what in the world? Well, that was a very big issue back then. So read that and, and take the principles that you can take from there and apply them to your life. 
Later on, she got to say, man, all she's writing about here is the publishing work, the publishing work, the publishing work. Read that in the same vein. And say, there's a message here for me somewhere, and read it and absorb what you can. And then when she's writing to dear brother F and sister C, say, I wonder here if there's something that I can learn for me. You read volume five of the testimonies, it will blow you away. It's one of the most powerful collections of writings that you'll ever, ever find. Friend of God, we used to call them the red books. I heard someone say the problem today is that they are the unread books. We got to read them. The devil, one of the reasons the devil hates the church is that we keep the Ten Commandments. Another reason is that we have the spirit of prophecy. Now, I'm not worried about you getting it out of proportion and getting overbalanced and underbalanced. If you read prayerfully, God will guide you in that. We mustn't relinquish this thing now. We are caught in a great battle, and we get to decide now whether we will yield to God and receive the seal of God or we will, whether we will refuse to do so and receive the mark of the beast. So what we find in here, again, I mentioned earlier today, how Ellen White once said, the message of the third angel is the message of justification by faith in verity, in, in truth. The message of the third angel is a call to all of us. Imagine this. The whole world is following a certain path, and it's contrary to the Bible. We didn't handle COVID well. Congregations arguing among whether we're going to wear masks or not. We should have been able to sit down at the table, uh, socially distanced, of course, and have a reasoned, Holy Spirit-led, prayer-saturated discussion about that. But instead, fur flew and feathers were ruffled on too many occasions. So you think that during the time of COVID, you get to act like a devil but when the mark of the beast comes along, you're going to be some little lamb. No, you're going to be just what you were then, unless you are converted. You see? Friend, what are we going to receive? I'm not sure as I look in the mirror that I like my chances as I look at me. And I'm saying to myself, man, are you yielded to God? Are you giving it to Jesus? And so every day I'm, I'm surrendering and I'm praying, God, take my heart for I cannot give it. It is your property. Keep it pure, for I cannot keep it for thee. I'm praying that prayer. Are you praying prayers like that? Lord, fill me with yourself today so that tomorrow, so that tomorrow I will stand for you naturally, just like a sunflower turns to face the sun. I will be turning in the direction of heaven. Friend, what are we going to, whose mark is in your forehead? Have you asked that question? It'd be too easy for me to stand up here tonight and start blasting at Rome and criticizing other churches and talking about the shenanigans that's going on in, in evangelical Protestantism. That'd be the easy part, but it wouldn't be the productive part. We would all leave here with our chests puffed out and our heads held high, and we would say, I thank God that I'm not like the other guy. That didn't work too well in the parable. It wouldn't work too well for us. Friend, I've read, I've read this thing, the three angels' messages. I say, God, help me. What a crisis down there. Lord, who shall be able to stand? But I believe that if we yield to Jesus, we'll be able to stand. I want you to turn with me now in your Bible to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 speaks directly to us. 2 Corinthians, fascinating book. It's a bit of a challenging book, to be honest. Starting in verse 3, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. And why is that? For the weapons of our warfare are what? Not carnal. They're not carnal. Our weapons are weapons such as prayer and faith, the word of God. That's what we major in. Our weapons are, as the apostle says, mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Verse 5, casting down imaginations. That's fascinating. Now, I like to read it out of the King James Version of the Bible. But if you looked at another Bible, you might see the word arguments there. I'm sure the perfect translation is, is, is something that embodies both of those, those ideas. Casting down imaginations and every, how many high things you tell me? Every high thing 
that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God. Come on now. And bringing into what? Captivity. Give me the next word. Bringing into captivity. Tell me. Every thought to the obedience of Christ. Now look at this. There's a great crisis in earth's last days. God's saying you can receive the seal of God or the mark of the beast. And if you're anything like me, you say, Phew. And now we read this, casting down all that stuff and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. And I said, oh, have mercy, Lord. I am so weak. But God says it's okay because my strength is made perfect in weakness. If you are strong, God cannot help you. But if you are weak, he can take your weakness and, and pour in his strength and move into the weakness of your life and, and strengthen you and fortify you with his own presence. Casting down imaginations and every high thing. We say, Lord, who can do this? We call out like Paul in, Revelation, in Romans 7, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? And he answers, I thank God through Jesus Christ, my Lord. Friend, there is a conflict on the way that's bigger than both of us, bigger than any of us. But it's not bigger than Jesus. And this is where we get to exercise faith and say, Lord Jesus, what I can't do, I believe you can do. Luther wilted. Peter wilted. Some of the reformers wilted before standing back up again after going to God and saying, strengthen me, Lord. We look at this tonight and we say, I have a choice. And I'm just not strong. I am only weak. But Lord, you are strong. You are great. He who has begun a good work in you is faithful to perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Being part of the remnant doesn't make you better than nobody. But what it does is it reminds you that we have been called to a high calling. And the only one who can do that work in our lives is Jesus. Jesus who lived and died a perfect death. He was nailed to the cross to demonstrate how serious heaven is about you. To tell you that you have worth and value and a future. Jesus said, I'll get them somehow. And if they got to nail me to a cross for me to get them, let them do it. Because you were worth it to Jesus. The cross says heaven is all in with you. The cross says when you cry out to God, God is with you. The cross says Jesus on the cross will be Jesus in your heart. The cross says there is power in the word of God available to you. Friend, Jesus is coming back. We can't check out now. We can't wilt now. We can't stumble now. I told the story a thousand times about a runner from New Zealand. She was running in the Commonwealth Games, the British Commonwealth Games. This is back in 1970. We used to see it in black and white in our TV sets, played again and again and again and again in a kind of a blooper reel. She was leading the women's 1,500 meters, a runner from New Zealand. Oh, I'm sure in New Zealand people were screaming at their black and white TV sets. And she got to within two meters of the finish line. That's six feet. And she fell. The gold medal was literally six feet away from her. And her leg said, I can't take you any further. Boom. She, you don't want to be like that in your Christian faith. Friend of God, Jesus says, God's seal, revelations mark. He says, I give you the seal. I will do the work in you. I will work in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. I will guide you. I will strengthen you. I'll be there for you. Now unto him who was able to keep you from falling. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that which you are able, but will with the temptation also make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Powerful stuff. This is the word of God. These are God's promises to you about what he will do in your life. Don't you look to the future with any fear. Look to heaven with great confidence. Don't you look forward and tremble. Look up. Because your redemption draws now nigh. God is fixing to do a great work in your life. If you let him, the best is yet to come. You read Revelation chapter 18 verse 1. And it tells you that before Jesus comes back, the world will be filled up with a manifestation of the character of God. How? In the person of God's saints. In other words, through the church. People will look at the church and say, I see Jesus. People will see their neighbors and say, 
There's something going on right there. People will see congregations of Seventh-day Adventists and say, I see the character of Jesus there. And if you struggle to believe that God will do that in your life, you don't have faith in the Word of God. It is God's Word, not mine. God's idea, not mine. God's promise, not yours. We are living on the cusp of the greatest events in human history. God is saying, come on, church, give me your heart. That's all. Don't make a promise. Just believe my promises to you. God is saying, I'm wanting to do more for you than you've ever had done in your life. He's wanting that. So now pray. Take hold of it. Tell God you have great expectations for what he's going to do in your life, in your community, in your family, in your church. The best is ahead. And here we are on the precipice of eternity. Everything going on around us tells us we're running out. Even the doomsday clock people, they push the clock closer to midnight. Secular folks looking on say this world does not have much time left. We know that. We've got a front row ticket. It's called the Bible. Very little time left. And the absolute best is yet to come. Friend, God is wanting to do a great thing for you. Mark of the beast, seal of God. Hey, come on now. Jesus. A real faith in Jesus. He will carry us through. Jesus. He will do in our lives what we cannot do for ourselves. I read a book. I've read more than one book, but I read a book recently. A friend at church, she said, you will want this book. She gave it to me. Just like that. Rescue at the top of the world. An amazing story. So you've heard of um, um, that guy. Can you, tell me, can you tell me who I'm referring to? Shackleton. Yeah, thank you. You've heard of the Shackleton story. There they were. They went to the South Pole. They didn't make it. The ice came in. Their boat was crunched up into matchsticks. They got in these little lifeboats, sailed off to, was it, uh, uh, some island. And then in order to, to save these men, they had to get in a little boat and sail across the Arctic Ocean. They went to South Georgia Island, got in a boat, came back a couple of times. Amazing rescue story. There's nothing compared to this one. The whaling fleet, way, way, way up north, north of Alaska, got stuck in ice when the sea froze around them. There were 300 men up there quickly running out of food. They were sheltering in one stinking, fetid, what would you call it, bunk room, 300 of them. And word got down to the mainland that these men were stuck up there. Well, there were so many months until the ice thawed out, they would all surely die. But they spoke to one man who worked for the, 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 the precursor of the Coast Guard. And they said, somebody's got to go. Even though his wife was about to have a baby there first, he said, I'll go. Now, he would have to sail to, call it somewhere near Alaska, and then go overland 1,500 miles in temperatures of 50 degrees below zero. They were being asked to take herds of reindeer up there to provide food. They had to haul sleds weighing thousands of pounds because they were taking provisions. It was the most unbelievable thing I've ever read. I, I got about three pages into the book, and I texted the friend who told me how to read the book, and I said, they're all going to die. There's no way it could work out differently. you got to read the book to understand the circumstances. The last third of the book, they would go over a mountain range. No one had ever gone over the mountain range. They were going to have to do it in winter. It's 50 degrees below zero. Well, you know how it ends. I'm not going to tell you they all died, but they started to die. Malnourishment set in. Some of those 300 men started dying. One here, one there. Their teeth began falling out. Their skin changed color. It was ghastly. And then like an apparition, these rescuers stepped out of a snowstorm and into that place. We've got food. We have provisions. Ain't nobody going to die. You're all safe and you're all saved. An amazing rescue. I mean, you've got to read it to really understand it. I can't convey the impossibility of it all. But somehow God was with those men, and they got through. Dramatic. Phenomenal. 
6,000 years ago, Jesus spoke to the nothing, and he said, let there be light. Then he created a world out of the things which do not appear or did not appear. He carpeted the thing with grass, and he added water and put animals there and birds in the sky, and then Adam and Eve, and then the fall. But as soon as there was sin, there was a Savior. How do you ransom a human family that has rebelled against the God of heaven? How do you do that? Well, Jesus came to this earth, an impossible rescue mission. He would never sin. Jesus set his divinity aside. I don't know how you do that, but I guess God does. And he lived as a human being, and he never sinned. And then placed upon Jesus was the sins of all the world. So heavy, it ruptured his heart within him. Before that time, he prayed the the prayer. Could you pray that prayer? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He bowed his head on his chest. He didn't fight the pain of the nails in his hands and his feet any longer. Into your hands I commend my spirit. Wow, the ground shook They placed him in Joseph's new tomb, but on Sunday morning, he was out of there and he ascended to heaven. He is now representing us, ministering for us at God's right hand, and he's on his way back. That rescue mission of the cross, unbelievable, but true. Soon, the heavens are going to depart as a scroll, and this Jesus is going to come riding down the great corridors of space. Friend, he will be coming back for you. Gravity is going to lose its hold on the souls of the saints. We are going up. The only thing that will prevent you from going up is your unwillingness to do so. If you're willing for God to work in your life, He will. If you're willing for Jesus to take away your sin, He will. If you're willing for God to give you a new heart, He will. If you're willing, the greatest rescue in the history of humanity It's soon. Jesus is coming back. He will have placed in the forehead of his saints the seal of God. We will have settled into all truth, settled into our relationship with Jesus. Oh, friend, what a great day. What great possibilities. What a great privilege. What a gift God wants to give you. But do you want the gift? We've got to have the gift. We've got to tell him tonight, Lord, give me the gift. We accept it. You know what somebody once wrote? She wrote, the Holy Spirit awaits our demand and our reception. When did you last get in God's face and say, I demand, not like, I demand that you give me the Holy Spirit. You can pray that prayer. And so we pray tonight, Lord, give us the gift. We accept the gift. Extend to us salvation again. We will take hold of it, and then we're going to trust in you to keep it where it ought to be. We're going to trust in you to keep our hand in your hand. We're going to trust in you, Lord, to live your life and our life. What seems impossible for man is possible for God, and he will do it all. Come on, we're going to pray our Father in heaven. We know that thousands of years ago, the greatest rescue mission ever undertaken was undertaken in our behalf. We look into the future. We see a great conflict brewing. That between the mark of the beast and the seal of God. And we want to be more than right. We want to be right with you. So do that work in our lives, Lord. Please do that work in our lives. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to accept the gift of salvation. We're going to receive the gift of salvation. If you want it, please raise your hand. Just lift up your hand. Only God is watching. You're just saying, I want it. That's why you're not saying I'm good enough. You're not saying I deserve it. You're not saying... I'm better than the guy next to me. You're simply saying, Lord, I desire the gift of salvation. Okay, okay. And now we're going to pray this prayer. Lord, I believe you have given me the gift of salvation. Raise your hand. I believe you've given it to me. It's not based on your goodness or on your performance. It's based on you accepting it from Jesus. Lord, we believe it. We receive it. We believe we have it. Now, Father, there's one more prayer we're going to pray. We are looking forward with confidence to the return of Jesus. Come on, raise your hand. Yes, that's right. Lord, we're going to be on the right side of this thing because Jesus is going to live on the inside of us. Keep us now and bless us. Not because we deserve it, but because you offer it to us. You want to do it. 
So go ahead and do it in our lives. We thank you. We praise you. We love you. We look forward to seeing you soon. And we pray in Jesus' name. Please say amen Amen and amen. God bless you. It has been a joy being with you. I trust you will enjoy the rest of camp meeting. You have some wonderful, wonderful speakers who are going to be ministering to you this coming week. So thank you, Oklahoma Conference. God bless you.